Good evening, good afternoon, whenever and wherever this may find you. Glad you guys are living long and prospering. <laughs> What's a Spock say? Don't play super glue when he does that. <laughs> it's the Hebrew schwa, I think. I think so, yep. Yeah. We're in part part 12 of the Doctrine of Christ, and we're going to look at the Satisfaction Theory of Atonement. So we've been looking at some theories of atonement, and I think we've kind of agreed that the Bible doesn't say that there's only one way of looking at this, even if you hold to the relatively modern uh, scapegoat theory. Uh, mm -hmm. We find the roots of that in the Old Covenant. Uh, we find uh, penal substitutionary atonement theories in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, so I think that the cross is a multifaceted thing, isn't it? That yeah. God has revealed himself and has told the truth of the cross through different lenses. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think that any of these are exclusive. I think that if it's grounded in the Old Testament, um, we ought to yeah. accept it. We had actually had a comment uh, from histori church historian in England on... We had a comment, you we, and I? Well, yeah, we had. Was, yeah, he made a comment. I think yes. it was on my... When I shared it on my Facebook page. But uh, he was talking about Gilbert Penman. Is that the name of the man or someone That's the called? name of the man. Okay. That's of course, cool. you know, I'll try to find it and eat up all of our time. That's okay. we got plenty of time. Gilbert doesn't mind who's watching yeah. this. Yeah, he says, uh, Isn't penal substitution taught pretty clearly in the early church fathers? Christ, though guiltless, bore our punishment so that he might abolish our guilt and take away our punishment. Augustine's reply to Faustus 414. So, okay. Yeah, so he's listened to it and made a comment about That's awesome. And what was his name again? Gilbert Penman. Gilbert, keep watching, bud. And thank you for the comment. And... <clears throat> I think that uh, the ransom theory is probably the oldest of the theories of the atonement. And so I said last week, I said that the church, there's been people in the church, a remnant, has always believed the, the penal theory, even in the darkest ages of Roman Catholicism. Right. Uh, that there's always this, it wasn't the reformers that created this. No. They didn't. So I agree with Gilbert. If there's, if there's information that shows that the early church fathers believed this, you bet. Um, I'm not sure if Augustine falls in the early church fathers or not, how early that is, uh, 300s. Yep. Um, Anyway, so, Gilbert, thanks for replying there, brother. Um, and if you have more insight, I'm going to check that out. Man. Yeah. I'll look at your comment on that. Yep. I just said thanks, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry is the expert, so if you oh, have yeah, comments or complaints. Yeah, no, I just say thanks, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. People are watching, you know. People at the church come up to me and say, you know, I enjoyed this or that. And I, I, was, I didn't know that was even an yeah, issue, that there yeah. was even discussions to yeah. have about this. I know back when we were doing demonology, uh... No. Did we do demonology? We did not. I did demonology. You did it. Never mind. Well, go ahead. No, somebody was uh, talked to me about it and said they were watching. I was really, really surprised. So, kind of go along with what you're saying there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah you're, you've been preaching a sermon series on uh, eternal security of the believer. Yes, yes. I'm going to wind it up, I believe, Sunday. Good deal. Anywho. Good deal. So we're at part 12 tonight. Part 12. Satisfaction theory of atonement, that God is satisfied somehow. So always look at these scriptures and start with that. Luke 23, 44 through 46. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light faded, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. All right. So... That's probably Christ's last words from the cross. He says, Christ has seven sayings from the cross, and five of the seven are directed to God directly. Right. Only two are directed to people. Uh, one is yeah. to the thief on the cross, this day be in paradise. And the other of the seven sayings is John, and this is your mother. Right. The other five of the sayings are directed to the Father. We can get to eavesdrop in these conversations he has with God the Father, like much like his prayer life. And here tonight, he is... He's breathed his last. He's wrapping up the, the atonement. He suffered all he's going to suffer. Right. And he's going to wrap it up right here. Into your hands, it's kind of all done. So with that, let's begin the discussion tonight on the satisfaction theory of atonement. In the 12th century, An Anselm of Canterbury proposed a satisfaction theory for the atonement. In this theory, Jesus Christ's death is understood as death to satisfy the justice of God. Okay. Satisfaction here means restitution, the mending of what was broken, and the paying back of a debt. In this theory, Anselm emphasizes the justice of God and claims that sin is an injustice that must be balanced. Anselm's satisfaction theory says essentially that Jesus Christ 
died in order to pay back the injustice of human, of human sin and to satisfy the justice of God, developed as an alternative to and, and a cr critique of Christ, Christus Victor theory. This is the satisfaction theory developed by St. Anselm, Anselm in the Middle Ages. Anselm developed an important theory of the atonement. So in this view, sin dishonors God by denying Him what is rightly His. God, as the greatest conceivable being, the perfect being, deserves worship. He deserves honor and, his, and majesty because of who He is. Hmm. And when we sin, we dishonor God by robbing Him of the glory and the majesty that He rightly deserves. Right. And as a result, Anselm says, man has rendered an infinite offense to God's majesty and honor. All right. One sin merits an eternity's worth of justice. Amen. Such is the nature of God. And if you were born perfectly in right standing with God and there was no inherent sin within you and you committed one offense, that's enough to right. put you in hell. That is, that is. But we're, I don't think that we're born perfectly without sin. I think that we're born with the curse of Adam. I think that uh, we are born fallen and yeah. falling every day yeah. until Christ yes. redeems us. Yeah, Christian life is repentance, a lot of repentance, mm -hmm. because we continue to sin because of the flesh. Right. Let's get a couple of questions under sure. our belt here. First question is, what do you think about the satisfaction theory of atonement? That it satisfies God's justice and yeah. wrath, and it satisfies yeah, perfectly. And yeah, I think, yeah, it does. Definitely does. Christ absorbed the, the wrath of God, the full measure of God's wrath against our sins, and satisfied God's justice. So, God was satisfied with the atoning death of his son. Yeah. Well, conversely, it doesn't dissatisfy God. Mm -mm. I mean, it pleased God to watch him suffer, yeah. and it, it satisfies uh, God's, uh, the offense that people made to God. Right. It satisfied, whatever that was, it satisfied it. Right. Um, I think the word restitution was used here to make amends, yeah, to make yeah. payments, right? And so we got to think of the idea, it's an analogy that sin is like acquiring a debt. Right. That when you sin, you acquire a debt, and the more sin you, sins you do, the more debt you find yourselves in, and there's no way to pay that off. Right. So Christ must pay that debt, right. that, that your debt's off for you. So that's what the satisfaction kind of gets to right. there. I think some of the parables Christ told regarding the forgiveness of debts, you know, debts that nobody could possibly ever pay in their lifetime. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah the, to the, that. Of the unforgiving steward, right, yeah. or who... who uh, who was given thousands of or billion dollars? I forgot right. the the current exchange rate, but it was billions of dollars of money. And then he goes out and finds the guy down the street who owes him like ten bucks. Right. And grabs him by the collar and roughs him up and throws him in debtor's prison. Right. And then then and in that story, the king goes and finds the man who forgave the debt and says, "How dare you not forgive this man right. for the little offenses?" Right. Um, and then he throws him in the same prison, doesn't he? Right. But we don't want to. Okay, we don't want to overcook that parable. No, it doesn't no. teach you fall from grace or lose salvation. No, That's not no. the point of the parable. It's the point that we should give it, forgive us. You have been forgiven. Right. And we've been forgiven a lot. That's right. Well, how would this question, too, how would this theory differ from the Christus Victor theory, or the ransom theory? Uh, the Christus Victor theory, is that uh, where we owe Satan? Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously, just what I just said throws it out the window for me, you know. Uh, we. Christ didn't die to pay Satan off. Right. He died to satisfy God's justice. And a lot of charismatics, for some reason, like that sort of idea that yeah. that when Christ was on the cross, it's because the devil put him there and the devil is punishing him and he descends into hell and the devil punishes him even more there. Mm -hmm. And somehow that when Christ raises from the dead, that Satan is surprised and is all of a sudden right. upset. No, Christ, Satan uh, was defeated on the cross. Right. When the promise, the oldest prophecy made is in Genesis 3, where he promises the woman, your seed, right. uh, his, he'll be bruised, but he'll crush the head of the serpent. Yeah. That who, ha who has the last laugh here is not the devil who's tricked you guys into sin yeah. and led you guys down this path, but it will be the one who comes from your lineage. Right. Uh, which, of course, we know is, is God himself. Amen. Yeah. I don't know why somebody would want to uh, accept a different version of the gospel. The gospel itself is, is the best story. It's the best truth that you can possibly ever imagine. And why do you want to trade it for, you know, giving Satan all this credit? I don't understand. Yeah. yeah the devil himself will be in hell. Yeah. He, he not only will be in hell, but there's no one to pay his ransom there. No. <laughs> no. Nope. You know, a man told me, uh, told our Sunday school class Sunday a joke, and it's an old joke, and I'm sure you've heard it before. Uh, so the setup is all 
um, bad theology, but it, it's a it's a funny joke. He said that there was a politician who died and went before Peter at the pearly gates, and you know Peter's the is the the benefactor of heaven. He gets to decide who gets in, gets out, and right. you know he has the keys of heaven. The, he's at the gates. That's bad theology. Bad right? theology. Bad theology. But that's how a lot of the heaven jokes begin. And so the politician uh, is in heaven, and Peter says, you know, we have a policy for our politicians that when they arrive at this point in the afterlife, they get to make a decision whether they're going to heaven or hell. He said, well, before you make the decision, you get to spend three days in each place. And so ah. the politician goes to heaven where he spends three days, and they're floating on clouds and the harps and all the angel wings and the halos and they're, you know, everybody's singing and he's like, that doesn't really thrill me that much. Again, bad theology. Bad theology, right. But I'll say if you don't enjoy church, probably won't enjoy heaven. Right, right. <laughs> but anyway, so he, bad, not a great experience in heaven, so he goes to hell. And in hell, he said there are these giant buffet tables and everybody's having a lot to eat. And there's he plays, you know, 18 holes of golf and then he sits on a beach and he spends three days like it's a, like a luxury resort <laughs> for three days, you know, and it's a great opportunity. Then he goes back to Peter at the gate and Peter said, you know, it's promised, you know, all politicians have a chance to make the decision here where to go. Three days there, you spent some time. Where do you want to go? And so the guy says, well, you know, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm, I'm going to go to hell. <laughs> Again, bad theology. Nobody in heaven wants to go to hell. <laughs> Even though, in fact, there's a great gulf fix between the two, right? Right. So it's full of bad theology, but it's set up for the joke. So, of course, he goes to hell, and he gets to hell, and it's just, it's horrible. It's darkness, and there's lakes of lava, and people burning in agonizing fire, and everything's pressured and, 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 you know, dying of great agony. You should imagine there's Satan there, you know, with pitchfork, torturing folks. Again, bad theology. Yeah. But he's there in hell to greet this guy. And, and the, the politician's like, I can't imagine, um, what a bait and switch. But, you know, you show me this for three days. Uh, and it's such a great time. And now I'm here. And it's, this, this is for eternity. And, and Satan says, yeah, well, we were campaigning. The election is over. Oh, oh, oh. There <laughs> so, we go. It made the point. That's right. <laughs> so it makes a good point, but it takes all kinds of bad theology to get there. Yeah, it, it took a lot of bad theology. <laughs> well, Satan, uh, and a, lot, a lot of afterlife jokes, he doesn't run hell. No. He doesn't oversee it. He doesn't. He's not in charge of the punishment. In fact, he'll be punished forever. Right. In fact, the Bible says... And then we're off on a tangent here, but the, de the hell was made for the devil and his angels. Right. People go there by default yeah. because of the fall into sin. Amen. Okay, let's look at this, the backdrop of ah. the satisfaction theory. Let's take this if you don't mind. All right, in Roman law, Roman Empire law, satisfaction refers to the amends that one makes for failure to discharge an obligation that one has. In private law, according to Rome, if you have a certain obligation to someone, that you're supposed to render and you fail to meet your obligations, then you owe satisfaction to that person. Work off your debt. This is a sort of way of making uh, amendment for failing to meet your obligations. In public Roman law, this could also be a form of punishment, public lashing. Now, the satisfaction might be a punishment that would be inflicted on the person in order to make these amends. Now, the church father, Tertullian, uh, picks up this term satisfactio and introduces it into Christian theology. All right. Okay, so uh, I was Anselm and Tertullian both had the, the idea of the satisfaction. Right. Right. And, you know, throughout cultures and the Old Testament and the ancient law, and even the Roman laws, the empire, there were debtors' prisons you go to oh, the old yeah. money. Yeah. Uh, even, even until um, fairly modern times in Europe, there were debtor prisons. People right. came to this country. Uh, in order to avoid debtors' prisons right. and whatever the case would be. That's the idea of you owing a debt and having to pay that off by work, forced yeah. labor, or time in prison, whatever the case would be. Yeah. And so maybe they're borrowing that concept to describe the atonement here. Mm. So how did the public death of Jesus serve to make amends? Well, obviously, he, he wasn't just crucified. You know, There was more to the atonement than just the physical death of Jesus. As we've already made clear, on the cross, Christ is atoning for sin. He's uh, drinking the cup to the dregs, the cup of God's wrath to the dregs. So it's not just physical death. Sure. You know, it's not just a public spectacle. Uh, he is on the altar before God, bearing our sins and the Father's wrath for our sins. Amen. Look at, look at old Tertullian if we can do that here. Yeah, so. Look at, 
Tertullian so. and introduces the term satisfaction or satisfaction Christology. Let's see. It has reference to the sacrament of penance in mm. the context of the Roman Catholic Church. We don't like that. Oh. In the context of the Roman Catholic Church, satisfaction refers to a reparation for sins which are committed after baptism. Yeah. Talk about bad theology. That's, it's this starting is, to This is not a joke, is it? This is one of these jokes? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. no, this is uh, this is some early church <laughs> okay. father bad theology, okay. right? They were not without error by any means. Oh, no. uh, you know, when we, we we do these studies, we do cite early church fathers to show historical precedents and beliefs right, and what goes right. to. But scripture has to be our foundation, yes, isn't it? Yes. And so we, we say, well, this church father got it right, or boy, he got it wrong, yeah, and this I mean, is where he went yeah. off the tracks. Amen. But it's scripture that makes that decision for us. Right. So. Again, when you're all when you're baptized, all your sins are washed away that you've heretofore committed. Okay. But when you begin to commit sins after baptism, and that's the moment you're walking out of the baptismal pool, right? Then there's need needs to be rendered some sort of satisfaction for those sins to make amends for them, like confession to a priest. Right. Okay. So according to Ter to Terlian, <clears throat> what role does the early Catholic priest play in the forgiveness of sins? No, I mean he hears your confession and. Baptism is very important in the Catholic Church. Yeah, you, once you're baptized, then after that, you, know, you got to go to the priest and forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And they're big into making reparations, right? Whether yes. you're just saying Hail Marys yeah. or you're going out and doing penance, some sort of work, the, right. the priest may say, okay, I understand you've done this sin. Now go out and do this, these three things this week. Right. Say this number of Hail Marys. Um, do these five other things, right? right. And then you'll be forgiven. Uh, well, Boy, that's that takes a pretty low view of the cross, doesn't it? Does. It does, yeah. I mean, you, you see where uh, purgatory, you know, falls into all of this. Yeah, he does make light of of Christ's atoning death. wasn't enough. Can get no satisfaction. <laughs> right. Uh, and so the believers got to work a little harder, try a little, a little do a little more, give a little more money, yeah. be more faithful to the church. Right. It's a good good system. <laughs> Yeah, and and, then, and then the good news is, if you don't do it in this life, you got a second chance yeah, in life to come. Work a little right. harder. Yeah, I mean, purgatory is not going to be a lot of fun, but you know it's temporary. Right, and you know if your family is faithful and doesn't forget about you, and they give money to the church, at least under the old system, they get you out a little faster. Yeah, and every I don't time know. a bell rings or what is yeah, that? Yeah, the angel gets his wings or <laughs> <laughs> the coffer. Oh yeah, clings. That's a, <laughs> a, a soul from purgatory flings. Yeah, wonderful life. I was thinking of something else. <laughs> I think that was the motto of the Middle Ages, the Dark Age was every time the coin in the coffer cling, rings, uh, so from purgatory f flings or springs. springs. <laughs> yeah. That's how non-Catholic we are in this. But that's that's an example of bad theology, right? Yeah, very much so. Uh, none of this is taught in the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach that you atone for your sins, you amend no, for your wrongs. No. Um, for by grace you save through faith, that not of yourselves, a gift of God, mm -hmm. not of works, lest they man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. That's right. Your salvation is not something that you achieve. If right. it were, you could boast. Yeah. Even if 1% of your salvation, 1% were something you could do, uh, then you get to heaven and say, Jesus, I thank you for 99% and that you get what you do, but you know, 1%. I did it. I, I wasn't that bad myself. I did all that I could do, that 1%. <laughs> right. Uh, hell is full of folks that didn't pay that 1%. And I'm mm. just thankful that I could pay that 1%. Well, right. when you get to heaven, you don't be thanking yourself for any of the things, that, any reason for being there. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Well, here's the unfortunate consequence for paying for your sins, Jerry. Mm -hmm. According to Anselm, I don't know how you say his name. I always say Anselm, and that, I don't think that's right. According to this guy, mankind found itself in a situation of having sinned against God and thereby having dishonored him and robbed him of glory and now owing this infinite debt to God. Since human beings are incapable of rendering this infinite satisfaction to God, it has to be done for them on their behalf. So when Christ offers to die to render satisfaction for us, the merits of his death and what he does to accrue are, uh, to our benefit, Christ offers an infinite satisfaction to God on our behalf. Eventually, this theory had the unfortunate consequence of leading to the notion of a sort of treasury of merit. Mm -hmm. A very Roman Catholic thing. Right. That was accrued by Christ and then also by certain saints that the church could then dispense to people who, say, gave benefic beneficiary gifts to build the church or other things to the church. Uh, that led to the abuses against which Martin Luther protested, 
where people were essentially buying their way into heaven by giving gifts that would then allow them to tap into this treasury of merit. But that is to add to the theory later on. If we stick with just Anselm, we do not have that element, and therefore the theory needs to be assessed in the form in which he gave it. So let's be fair to Anselm and, and yeah. not, not even go down the Tertullian route. Let's just right. say satisfaction that Christ paid the debt you could not pay. Right. Uh, and we have to say as Protestants, and back to the Bible folks, we have to say that nowhere in the Bible is it taught that we, we get into heaven based on the backs of the saints and mm -hmm. the merit of the... They didn't get extra work that's in a bank account somewhere that you can tap into if you pray yeah. to that person. Yeah. Or that you can access it uh, for your loved one in purgatory if you paid the church yeah. X number of dollars. Yeah. It's almost smacks of uh, prosperity gospel at times, doesn't it? You know, you gotta, if you do this, you'll get this. Mm -hmm. you, know, and you, you give all this uh, back. tangible stuff and you'll get some... <laughs> you know, get out of hell free cards. Yeah, so they'll take that phrase like, lay up in yourself, in heaven treasures for yourself. And they take that, not as being some metaphor, right? right. But as being some actual tangible thing which you put into account, which right. can be tapped into. Well, the Bible yeah. doesn't teach that. No, in these passages, no, no. Um, and that's where, uh, that's where a lot of Roman Catholics get it wrong, uh, is how they interpret some passages. They do interpret scripture a lot of times, or rather misinterpret scripture, right. because they, they push a phrase wouldn't literally when it's not meant to be. Right. Christ said, this is my blood. He's meaning that in the sense in which Jews would use things allegorically, right? right. This is symbolizing my blood. It right. symbolizes my body. Yeah. So we have to understand those kinds of those phrases, yeah, unless you, we yeah, become that, cannibals. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, you take the Bible literally, which means, you know, per genre, if it is, uh, there's metaphors, figures of speech, you name it, in different types of literature. And so you read through the book of Revelation, and you're going to have to recognize there's a lot of typology and different things in there. You just don't take in a wooden literal sense. Mm -hmm. So, I think that Anselm was onto something that what yeah. Christ does on the cross does satisfy the yeah. Father. He doesn't la leave anything lacking for us to make up a right, difference. Right. And it's completely atoned for. Now, other church fathers may have added to this, and certainly through the history of the Roman Catholic Church, it got way down the path and added a lot of things that weren't supposed to be right. there. So be very careful to keep it you know, back to the Bible. Right. Qu two questions. We wrap this up tonight. Uh, what were the flaws that came from this theory of atonement? What were some yeah. flaws? Um, I forget what it was called. but the Satisfaction. Uh, yeah, the satisfaction and this you know, kind of treasury of merits where you could, you know, either Christ or the saints, tap into that and get some, get some merit going your way. Obviously, that takes away from the full satisfaction of the atonement. I agree. And what is the downfall of allowing sinful man to pay for his <laughs> sins? What's the downfall? Well, of the that? downfall is he can't. Mm -hmm. So, this is not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and every every religion, to an extent, I, I can't think of an exception, but they they might be. So I'll say nearly every religion offers a way in which man can atone for his sins. Yeah. Whether it is the Buddhists getting rid of desire, which is another way of saying sin, yeah. or whether it is. Uh, um, the Muslim who who must do the five pillars of Islam faithfully, make the trip you know to Mecca, and must do the five daily prayers, all those kind of things, right? All systems of religion, and there may be one an exception to this, offer a plan to get rid of your sin, and that, it appeals to man's fallen nature to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it really does. So it, it, it's just perfect, ripe for picking. <laughs> right, the devil gives you what you want, doesn't yeah. he? Uh, people want to believe uh, what they want to believe. Yeah. I'm all for, uh, I can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. I Christ know can me. do it all. I know me well enough to know that I couldn't do it anyway. No, yeah. I don't have, no. My heart's black. Yeah. And if God did say, here's three things you got to do, and you'll do these and you'll be saved. I like it at first because it gives me something tangible to do, but then after a week I'm like, I can't do these faithfully enough. Yeah. I realize how how impotent I am to do the three things yeah. you told me to do. Yeah, just try to love your neighbors yourself. You know, <laughs> that doesn't go very far. Mm -mm. You can't do it. Yep. It just shows us that we're guilty. Mm -hmm. And it takes us to Christ, who satisfied completely the justice of God on our behalf. That's right. And we, we, we bring this back. There's no creedal position on the atonement theory for in the church history. 
But we know that every Christian must believe that Christ died in his place, whatever that means for the believer. Right. And we can infer that the thief on the cross who did get into heaven, get into paradise, did not know entirely what Christ was accomplishing. Right. The nature, the person, the work of Christ. Right. He just exercised the amount of faith that he had, as small as it was, and trusting in Christ was going to let him come into the kingdom of God. Yeah. yeah. He was putting his faith... In the right person. Yes, that's, that's important. That's, what, that's what's significant. Your faith is only as good as what you put it in. Put it in yourself, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to fail. Put it in Christ, it's sufficient. Amen. Yeah, he did the work in our place, we just trust that he did Amen. it. Amen. Uh, you know, get, you get on, this is a crude analogy, you get in an airplane, you don't have to fly the airplane, you just have to trust the one who can fly, yeah. he'll get you where you're going. Right. Uh, nowhere does American Airlines expect you to get in the cockpit and start flying an airplane. Man, I hope not. We're in trouble. <laughs> Right. There's a lot of fail-safe things that have failed, right, uh, before me to get in that cockpit on a, <laughs> yeah. on a flight uh, to ever get in that position. You know, pilots are both dead. The backup pilot is dead. The, the, the systems have failed to fly the plane and land the plane. Right. I'm a last resort. Right. And so with Christ, he's a pilot that never dies. He's a Amen. fail-safe. Amen. Fail-safe plan. Yeah, put your faith in him. You're secure. Amen. Amen. Um, as we close out tonight, let's see if any more thoughts or insight. No, I think we covered it pretty well. Uh, pray for a lady at our church named Sylvia. She was an elderly lady, lives near the church, and she was out doing some yard work, and she fell and broke her hip this oh, past no. weekend. Yeah. Okay. She's very active, but you get to be older. Those bones, bones are brittle. Yes, they are. All right. We'll pray for Sylvia. And your daughter? Daughter's doing well. I take her to the doctor in the morning, and uh, they look at her foot. Last week's visit was good. The incision looks good. And she has two more weeks before she can put any weight on it. So uh, when those two weeks are up, she'll wear a boot, and she'll be able to put pressure on the boot and walk or hobble. But and it was not a result of an injury. This is like a genetic sort of yeah, a thing, a bone had, issue. Yeah, she had a bone issue in her foot, and they took that bone out and reattached the tendon where it was supposed to be. And uh, she's uh, making progress. Yeah. She'll be up and kicking. Up and kicking. <laughs> I'm still kicking. I'm still kicking. All right, if there's nothing else, brother, and close this yep, out. let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our study tonight. We thank you for Christ's atoning death. Thank you for the forgiveness that, that you have given us in Christ. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to do anything, Lord, to add to what Christ has done. How could we? And, Father, thank you for that. Thank you for that salvation uh, is there and available for those who will repent and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for uh, our, our homes and our, our families, our kinfolk. We pray for friends and neighbors. God, we lift up our churches to you. Father, we pray specifically for Sylvia that you would help her to recover and uh, give her her health. Uh, thank you that my daughter's doing well. Just pray she has a good doctor's visit tomorrow. And Father, we just lift the concerns and fears of the, that we have up to you, knowing that you're sovereign. Lord, now forgive us for our many transgressions. Sanctify us according to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Those that watch, we're glad that you do. Keep watching, make comments, and yeah. if you make a comment and it's appropriate, read this aloud. Yeah. If it's inappropriate, <laughs> forget it. I'm going to block you. <laughs> we'll answer your questions you may have. And if not, if somebody watches and has a, an answer, we can defer you to yeah. that person. Yeah. And if you think we're wrong, you can... You can offer the correction and we'll look at it. Yeah, we're armchair theologians, man. Yes. We're, we're very amateur at this. Yes, I'm very ammy. <laughs> know enough to get ourselves in trouble. Yes. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you same bat time. Same bat channel. God bless.